Pass it to your neighbor and offer them a warm First Church welcome. We'd appreciate that. If this is your Sunday to unite with our community of faith, we ask you to locate the How to Join card in your pew pocket this morning. Complete it, bring it forward at our closing hymn. And Dr. Lamar Smith and Dr. Brewster, uh, we will be happy to receive you and our community of faith this morning. Well, this is Mother's Day, and we want to express our appreciation today for mothers and all the influential women in our lives, for all the many gifts and blessings that they've shared with us over the years. And we want to thank those who are here with us today and those who've gone before us and others who are distant this way, but it's still in our hearts and our minds today, and share our appreciation to all of them as well. Will you turn to your neighbor this morning, all women around you today, and say, we appreciate you and all the gifts and blessings you bring us today. Would you do that for a moment? Just turn to those around you and say, we appreciate you, all women. All women. <laughs> we do, we do appreciate you all today. We appreciate you all and all the gifts and blessings you uh, do bring to us, not only today, but throughout the year. And we thank you so much. Today, the uh, ninth grade Sunday school class is doing something special for Mother's Day. They're uh, giving the facility staff the day off so they can be with their families, worshiping in our community faith or other churches this morning. And they're taking care of all the facility uh, operations this morning to help them out and give them a break today on Mother's Day. So thank you, ninth graders and their leaders. Also, uh, you might turn to your bulletin, look at the opportunities for service and fellowship this week. The college ministry summer events are fantastic. Look those over, the Bubba Crocker Pie Bake Off. All you men are invited to help us bake some pies for that and help support our summer mission trips. And also the uh, children's summer events. Take a look at those as well. And we wanna make one uh, special announcement today and that is uh, congratulations to Paige Hines, our director of our First Street Mission. Uh, we wanna express our appreciation to her for the wonderful ministry she has there and congratulate her today on her graduation from Bright Divinity School uh, yesterday and the celebrations this weekend she's having. And uh, Paige, we just wanna thank you for your fantastic ministry, for all you do to support our mission, also for going to school and reaching this wonderful milestone. So Paige is over here. Paige, will you stand so we can express our appreciation to you? Congratulations, Paige. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, make us joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with singing. Let us praise God with joy and with thanksgiving. Good morning. You're invited to participate in the morning worship service of First United Methodist Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. Tim Brewster, Senior Pastor of First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Welcome to this service of worship. I'm glad you've chosen to join us in this broadcast of our 11 o'clock worship service. And I hope you can join us in person at one of our services at 8.30 in the chapel, 9.30 in the sanctuary, 11 o'clock in the sanctuary, and at 11.11 in Wesley Hall. On behalf of the whole congregation of First United Methodist Church, I welcome you.
Let us pray. This is a day unlike any other that has ever been, O oh God, filled with promise of flowers that have never before bloomed, thoughts that have never been thought, friends that have never been met, prayers that have never been uttered. Grant that we shall not miss it, but shall be alert to all our being to the wonders of this new day Fill our hearts with praise and our spirits with thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
I invite any other uh, children who would like to come forward and join us here at the front for, uh, for our time together. That was wonderful. Y'all sounded just great, and your mothers too. That was really good. It's really good. Well, we all know what today is, don't we? Mother's Day. Right, Mother's Day. <clears throat> and I have a Mother's Day card that I brought with me um, to um, remind us of the day. It says, today's a very special time to let her mother know she's always treasured in the hearts of those who love her so. And then it lists some things in the inside that are special about mothers. Can you think of some things that are special? Come on. Some things that mothers do for us. And that teach us, right? Give presents, somebody said. Yeah. They care about us. They sure do. Yes, they, they made us live because we came out of them, you said. That's right. That's right. They snuggle with us, right? They serve us, right. <laughs> they help us when we need help, right. They let us do crazy things. But not too crazy, right? <laughs> what, what else? Can you think of anything else? We do. We love our moms. That's right. They make us be happy. You know, the list is really long, isn't it? We could... They bake pies. They bake pies. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Okay. There's a long, long list of all the very special things about about our mothers. And that's what we're celebrating today. And we're giving thanks to God for our mothers today. This is like a little Thanksgiving celebration too. But we're giving thanks in particular for our mothers and stepmothers and grandmothers and aunts and all kinds of caring people who are caring women who are like mothers to us as well. Okay, let's bow our heads for a prayer and y'all repeat after me and we'll pray together that way. Oh God, thank you for our mothers and our grandmothers and our great-grandmothers and all the other people who are mothers to us and to others. In Jesus' name, amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband, even if, even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons. Would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or turn me back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Your people shall be where you where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, 
even if death parts me from you. God speaks to us through the reading of the scripture. What more appropriate day for a baptism. Let us open our hearts and our minds as we join together with the Seagraves family for the baptism of their child. to us of the mercy and grace of God, indicating that you and I do not come into relationship with God on the basis of anything that we ourselves do, but simply upon the basis of God's gracious initiative toward us. The baptism of children is a particularly significant manifestation of this sign. It is also a sign that you and we together will seek to raise this child in a, in a home of love so that she may be all possibly that she could ever be. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, let the children come unto me, do not forbid them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. And I ask you now, as you stand before God in this congregation, uh, do you affirm your faith in Christ? And do you promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? And will you nurture Cadence faith in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, she may be guided to accept God's grace for herself, to profess her faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? Yes. Cadence faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now if you'll gather around, place your hands on her. Cadence, faith, the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born of water and the Spirit, you will remain a faithful disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. She's taken the microphone, <laughs> and it almost went in the mouth. <laughs> Here we go. Let's turn around here. It won't be the first time. It's gone in the mouth before, and apparently it's waterproof, so it works out pretty good. <laughs> Cadence Faith is the newest member of the household of faith. Uh, we, along with her parents, pledge ourselves to do all that we can to help nurture her in the Christian faith so that as she grows up among us, she will come to know the love and the grace of God and how we live that out in our own lives. Uh, so that someday she will stand at this or some other altar and make her own profession of faith in Christ. All this is God's wonderful gift offered to us without price. She seems pretty comfortable in the church already, don't you think? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let us join in our response. With God's, God's help, help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ. The cadence faith, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life.
the Lord. I will extend prosperity to her like a river. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm. As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. There is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God. Gracious God, on this Mother's Day, we celebrate the women who have so impacted our lives. We rejoice in the many personal sacrifices that they have made to ensure we are well taken care of. We find joy in the many pearls of wisdom that they have passed on to us, even when we were less receptive to receive them. We delight in the love and care that they have given to us and to those around us even when they did not feel like showing compassion. We give thanks for these women who have modeled for us the unconditional love of God through the simple acts of care, nurture, and compassion. When we skinned our knees, they not only put on the antiseptic and the Band-Aid, 
but added the simple touch of a kiss, which made everything better. When we needed comfort, they were there with outstretched arms ready to receive us. And when we needed help, they were there ready to love us, which was often the only help that we needed. So on this Mother's Day, we give thanks to these women who have so impacted our lives, who have shown us your love, and who have given us a glimpse of your presence here on earth. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Epistle reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. It is found on page 211 in your New Testament. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, grateful when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. Thanks be to God.
Well, I want to add my Happy Mother's Day greeting to all of you who are mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers, those who are stepmothers, those who have been and continue to be mothers to many people, to nurture many children and to care for uh, many people in that wonderful motherly way. And we just give thanks to God for you on this, on this special day. Our text for today in the fifth verse of that text contains words that may never make it onto a greeting card, but they could. They could actually make a really good Mother's Day card, it seems to me. They're words not as well known as other scriptures in the Bible. Faith, hope, love, abide these three. The greatest of these is love. Everyone knows that. Perfect love casts out fear. There are many verses we know better than this one. But this one says something really important to us on Mother's Day. And it's a word of greeting to Timothy, a young leader in the early church. And the words are these. I'm reminded of your steadfast faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother, Lois, and then in your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. A faith that first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and then your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. You listen to those words and you realize that Timothy is a third generation Christian. We know from Acts that his father was not a believer. But we know from this text that a living faith, a faith that lived in Lois, his grandmother, was passed on to his mother Eunice. And that faith became in her life a living faith. And that faith was passed on to Timothy. In my imagination, I can imagine that Lois, and certainly Eunice, had a big part to play in Timothy's naming. Because his name is important. For one thing, it's a great name. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I'm partial to it anyway. But more important than that, in antiquity, <clears throat> where names have meaning, and everybody knows the meaning of their name, and they talk about the meaning of their name, and sometimes they try to live up to the meaning of their name. The name Timothy may have been chosen carefully by his grandmother and mother. The name means one who honors God. And I can imagine, we don't know this, but I can imagine that Growing up as a <clears throat> child, Timothy might ask about his name. Tell me the story of my name. And Lois and Eunice would say, well, we named you Timothy because we knew you would be someone who honored God with your life. And perhaps many times that was a teaching moment for Lois and Eunice to say something to Timothy about who they believed he would become and who he would be. The living faith that Lois and Eunice had became a living faith for Timothy because they nurtured and encouraged that in him. They were living out what is a great call that is a part of our faith as Christians. As people of faith, we are called to pass on that faith to the next generation. And especially we celebrate how our mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers and others who have been mothers to us have done exactly that. We celebrate the faith of our mothers. Go back to the book of Deuteronomy and you find there words that are central to the Jewish faith, the Shema. The words say, Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Keep these commandments that I have given you in your heart. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise up. The word is to teach these commandments, these traditions, these values, this faith, this trust to the next generation, and surely Lois and Eunice did that for Timothy. Imagine if they hadn't. Imagine if Lois had taught Eunice and had planted that seed, but Eunice didn't accept it. She didn't nurture the seed. She didn't allow it to take root in her own life, and she didn't pass it on to Timothy. Imagine if Lois had not taken the trouble to do that with her own daughter, and Eunice had not gone the extra mile, taken the effort, possessed the discipline to pass on the faith to her son. The early church would have been deprived of one of its bright young leaders, a third generation Christian, because Lois and Eunice passed on the faith. In the baptism service, that service that we participated in a few moments ago, these parents and other parents who stand at this altar profess their faith in Christ. They promised to serve him as Lord in union with the church. And they promised to nurture the child in the Christian faith. In other words, they promised, as parents do when they stand in this place, to pass on the faith, to do what we are called to do as parents, and how powerful that is. And so when I look around in this congregation, and I see parents and grandparents, and those step-parents, and I see mothers and grandmothers and great-grandmothers who have intentionally taught their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, have lived out that faith and trust in God and faith in Christ, have taught the teachings of Jesus to their children. Then I give thanks to God for the ways in which you are passing on the faith to those who come after us. Unfortunately, not all parents take up that challenge. I, through the years, I've, it's been a long time, I have to say, since I've heard this. I, I would guess five, six years probably since I've heard it, but I used to hear it more often. Parents saying, well, we don't want to indoctrinate the kids. You know, we want them to make their own decision. We, you know, about religion, that's an important thing, but we just think they ought to just make their own mind up about it. And my response was always to those parents, something like, sometimes with more or less sarcasm than I'll share it with you now, something like, well, so do you do that in other important areas of your child's life? Did you just sort of leave potty training up to them? You know, if they, if they decide they want to do that, fine. Or, you know, do they want to go to school? I don't know. Let's ask them. And then we just sort of leave it up to them. Want to get a job someday? Well, I don't know whether that's important. Well, we'll let them decide what happens. You know, just, of course they don't do that. And so the question is, in this particularly critical part of their lives, why would you leave it up to chance? Why would you leave that up to chance? I was sharing a story in our Ten Commandments Bible study this past week of the poet uh, Coleridge, the English poet, was having a, a friend visit in his home one day, and, uh, and the friend was saying, well, I don't believe in, in uh, indoctrinating children. You just let them decide on their own what they believe about religion. And they argued a bit about that, and, and they kind of moved on to another subject. A few minutes later, Coleridge said, would you like to go out and see my garden? And the friend said, sure. And so they went out to the garden, and there was nothing but weeds in the garden. The friend said, well, this is just a bunch of weeds. Coleridge said, well, you know, I just believe in letting the garden express itself however it wants to, make its own 
production. And that's my philosophy of gardening. And of course, he made his point very well. And that is this critically important gift that grandmothers and mothers give to us, the gift of faith. But you know, there's another side to that gift. And we see that in this same text because if you, if you pay close attention, the message to Timothy is, is I am reminded of your faith. Your faith, Timothy. It is a faith that first lived in Lois, your grandmother, and then lived in Eunice, your mother, but now I am sure lives in you. It's your faith, Timothy. And how many times have I known parents and grandparents who have planted those seeds of faith, but they haven't taken root? Or they haven't taken root yet? Sometimes those seeds of faith are just late in sprouting. And maybe it takes some incident in the life of the child as they grow into adulthood to bring them to that place of a growing vital faith. Sometimes that never happens. But you see, the, the point is that the grandmother and mother and other caring adults in the life of that child, plants, they, they plant the seed. But ultimately, it's the child's faith. Ultimately, it's the decision that the child will make to receive it and then to nurture it, to enable it to take root and bear fruit in the life of that person. We celebrate the faith of our mothers, but the faith of our mothers is a living faith we have received. We're called to make it our faith. Someone has said that God has no grandchildren as a way of expressing that in a sense Every person's faith is a first-generation faith because we must make our faith our own. Now with Timothy, Timothy receives a reminder. And the reminder is, I remind, he's, the words to Timothy, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you. To rekindle the gift of God that is within you. That word rekindle is only found here in the New Testament, and it means literally to stir up a fire. Clarence Jordan, in his Cotton Patch version of the Gospels, translates it as, uh, I remind you to shake the ashes off the fire that burns within you. And he uses that translation because that's the image. The word rekindle is not to bring another source of flame to start the fire again. Rekindle means to stir it up. You, you get the image in your mind, don't you? Coals that are burning brightly and putting off great warmth, but over time they begin to get that ash covering over them. And they grow darker and darker and colder and colder until you, you take a, a fireplace poker and you stir up those coals and knock the ashes off and the fire burns brightly again. That's the image here. And the message to Timothy is, continues with, God has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but God has given us a spirit of power and a spirit of love and a spirit of self-discipline. And when we think about how it is in our own lives that we knock the ashes off of our faith and we keep it vibrant and alive so that it doesn't grow dim and cold, it is through receiving God's gift of power, the Holy Spirit, the wind of God, the breath of God, the fire of God, anew into our lives to rekindle and stir us up that our faith the faith we receive from our mothers is our faith, and it's a living faith, and a vibrant and alive faith. It is receiving the presence of God into the center of our living, the spirit of power. It's also the spirit of love. It's living out 
what Jesus taught us and who Jesus calls us to be, to follow in his footsteps of love and service because our faith grows cold when we do not practice the teachings of Jesus. Our faith grows cold when we stop giving of ourselves and when we stop loving others. Because to do so, to love others, is to rekindle the gift of God that is within us. And the word to Timothy is to receive that spirit of self-discipline because it's through the practice of the spiritual disciplines of prayer and, and worship, the discipline of reading and studying the Bible and the discipline of serving and the discipline of, of giving and the discipline of Christian relationships that give life. You recognize those as the marks of discipleship. All of these are ways to fan the flames of our faith and to keep our faith alive and vibrant, a living faith so that we might pass it on to the next generations ourselves. Thanks be to God for our grandmothers and mothers, for all of you who nurture a living faith in our children. And may we in each of our lives live up to that faith through stirring up the gift of God that is within us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
expectations of our mothers. And may these gifts we bring be expressions of a stirred up faith in us. In Jesus' name, amen. In the new card that you have there entitled How to Join, there is an explanation of how people transfer from other denominations or how they come by faith into our church. And on the inside, as was announced, you just fill this out and bring it forward and we'll be delighted to have you in our church family. Our hymn of invitation this morning is number 272 and as we sing it, we invite to the chancel you who would join our church today. First service this morning, Michael and Leslie Fertitta became members of our church family, and Gloria Justin Hayes came back home to First Methodist. And this is Wendy Stromer from another United Methodist Church in the area, and we're delighted to welcome her into our church family at this service. Wendy, as you become a part of this congregation, I ask you, do you reaffirm your faith in Christ? And will you be loyal to the church and uphold it by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Welcome again to you. I'm going to ask Wendy to stay down front and give you an opportunity to come by and give her a warm First Church welcome as the newest member of our community of faith. Our gathering will soon be ended. Where will we go and what will we do? May grace, peace, hope, love, and joy forever accompany you. Amen. Mm -hmm. 